hello everyone once again now today we're going to talk about these IGBTs again but we're gonna do more than just talk we're gonna take a look at the impact that capacitors snubber capacitors and gate resistors have on the IGBT and like I say we're not gonna be just talking we're gonna actually be showing you what's gonna happen and you'll see how in just a minute so hang on okay before I go any further explaining to you how I'm gonna show you all this we're first going to take a look at the setup what we're working with in the top we can see we have an IGBT module hooked up to a few capacitors and on the bottom right we have a gate driver and the timer chip. The IGBT is a CM75DU-12F so it's 75 amps and 600 volts rated. And the capacitor is 450 volts rated and 6000 microfarads. The snubber capacitor is 1000 volts rated and about 2 microfarads. The power source will be one of those batteries right there, the gray ones, they are 12 volts, they are 17 amp hours, and the load will be that light on the left. It's 12 volts, and it's 55 watts. And this is how it will all be hooked up, so get a good look at that for a minute. The gate driver, HCPL3120, will be driving the lower stage IGBT. It is a dual module. The upper stage we will not be using, we will only be using the diode from that, so it will act as a chopper. You see the load connected there. Okay, so now I'm just going to start up the timer, and we will get an output, and the light should light up. Okay, so at this point you're thinking, What's so special about this? Well, there's a lot of things happening here in the IGBT module. We know it's switching on and off. We know it's switching at a certain frequency, give or take. We can take a good guess about the frequency that it'll be switching at just by looking at the capacitor and the resistor on the timer, since it is just a 555 timer. But what we can't actually see is the voltage spikes and we cannot see how long it's taking the IGBT to turn on and off right now. Now obviously if we were to just connect the light to the battery and pulse it manually with a hand we would see sparks flying off of the terminals. When we see a kind of a gold yellow spark that that's just hot metal but when we see a blue spark that's actually a voltage spike and of course that's due to inductance. That is, any time there's current flowing through a circuit, there's that magnetic field around it and it's built up. And every time it's disconnected, it doesn't want to let go because of the voltage spike. It's the nature of inductors or anything with significant inductance. And basically, that means that an inductor will resist a change in current by producing a voltage. All that is happening inside the IGBT module itself, inside the packaging, and around the wires here connected to the battery and connected to the light. And I explained that earlier in videos about how that has a detrimental side effect on the IGBT module. But we can't really actually see that right now unless we have a special tool. And that special tool is this, an oscilloscope. And wouldn't you know it, I got one. So now that I have this, we're going to have a lot of fun. And we're going to do a lot of things with the IGBT modules. We're going to learn a lot more new things with them. So, let's get right to it. Okay, currently I've got this scope probe hooked up right between the E2 terminal and the common terminal, C2E1. And we can see 
on the scope trace right there it's measuring the voltage of the battery and I also have the meter hooked up and you can see in the top right hand corner it says 12.47 volts just about 12 and a half volts and triggers 9.6 volts so it's off right now because it's reading the full voltage of the battery which means that there's nothing none of that going into the light but if we start the timer we can immediately see the trace and what's interesting about this trace it looks very familiar to most people who know and work with power electronics because what's happening is we're seeing the IGBT actually turning off with this trigger the IGBT begins to turn off here and the voltage rapidly rises up vision so the so now it's set for 100 nanoseconds per division of time so we can see how long it takes for the IGBT to turn off and we can see the duration of the spike and on the vertical we can see of course the voltage of the spike and right now it looks like that spike is right around 15 or 16 volts and that's with the capacitor and the current gate resistor that we have and I told you the value of the capacitor and the value of the gate resistor is somewhere around 110 ohms but let's take a look at what would happen if we change the value of the gate resistor first okay so we went from about 110 ohm gate resistor down to a 20 ohm gate resistor. Now you can see what's happened to the spike voltage. It's actually gone off the chart at 5 volts per division. Well, we can see in the time it takes a lot sh less time, a lot less time for it to turn off. But then the side effect of speeding that turn off up is the spike voltage. Now, as I've explained before, having a short turn off time is a good thing in some ways because that means we can get higher frequencies and that means we get less loss in the form of switching losses which translates into heat let me change the scale 10 volts per division and we can see we're actually jumping up to something like 22 or 24 volts with that gate resistor. So, in another video I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the cooling of the IGBT module, but now I'm going to actually change the capacitors and show you what effect that actually has on it. Okay, so I've taken the 6000 microfarad capacitor off. And it's just using the snubber capacitor now, which is 2 microfarads. That is getting a little bit higher. Adjust the timer a little bit. That's just barely on. Okay. And it looks about the same, but what would happen if we changed the time scale? Let's see. Now, what we see when we change the time scale is we actually have a second spike without that larger capacitor. Okay, so now I'm just going to take another little snubber capacitor connect it across those terminals and we should be able to see that waveform change. There we go. And that's smoothed out some and when I remove it, it reverts back to the way it was. Now, the reason that this is actually happening, that the one spike that we saw with a shorter time scale hasn't changed, but this one with the longer time scale does change, is because that's actually the inductance of the wires from the battery to the IGBT module itself. And the other shorter one is actually the inductance inside the IGBT's package itself 
We can add capacitors and we can fix what we're seeing now, but we actually can't fix what's inside the IGBT module itself with capacitors. Well, that's to say we can, but only within a certain extent. We can't change it as easily as we can the outside inductance. I should say the internal inductance and the external induct inductance. So, I just said that the IGBT does have an internal inductance and to most people that might be a little bit surprising like an IGBT inside really? There's wires in there and things that can store magnetic fields in a circuit? Well, if you've never seen, now you're going to the inside of the IGBT module. Now the larger chips would be the actual IGBT there and that would be the diode, the freewheeling diode. And this has got six of them obviously because this is for a um, for a three phase inverter but anytime current starts moving through those bond wires onto these IGBT chips right there anytime current starts flowing in that and you try to turn it off that magnetic field surrounding those bond wires wants to keep it going so there's going to be a voltage spike regardless of what capacitors we put on the outside of it and the bad thing about that is not only does that limit the switching frequency but it also gets worse with larger IGBTs now I hope you're not too disappointed but the top will not be coming off of this one but the one we were just looking at was 75 amps and this one is 400 there we go so the bond wires in there, we've probably got just as many bond wires and just as many chips in this one even though there are only two IGBTs really because they tend to parallel those up and that means we're going to get more inductance for one IGBT instead of say four because they're in parallel they probably have four in parallel so I've got the inductance of four chips and only one switch. Now, as I said, that limits switching frequency, but that also limits the maximum voltage at which we can use them because, of course, switching them creates a voltage spike. And we cannot exceed that voltage spike, or that's to say, that voltage spike can't exceed the rating of the IGBT, or the IGBT could be destroyed and it could end up looking like that so definitely don't want to have an over voltage spike so looking at the scope again with the same setup that we had and the 20 ohm gate resistor we can see that it does spike up to almost two times of what we're putting into it in terms of voltage. So if we're putting in 12 volts and we can see that spike is just about going to 24 volts. So the IGBT is rated for 600 volts. That means if we were to put 300 volts through this IGBT right now with the same current, that means the IGBT would be pretty well near destruction because we've just hit the limit of two times the voltage rating of it so, so it would go up to it would go all the way up from 300 volts up to 600 volts across those terminals okay so I've changed the gate resistor back to a 110 ohm gate resistor and we can see that spike is gone down a lot but if we change the time scale again we see 
we still have that big nasty external inductance which again we can actually fix by putting a capacitor on it it goes down dramatically when I touch it just touch it there on the C1 and E2 terminals we take it off and it goes right back okay now I went back to the original setup with the 6000 microfarad capacitor and this number capacitor and the 110 ohm gate resistor and as you can see that's that initial internal spike there is smoothed out from the gate resistor obviously but let's change the time scale and see if that other big nasty secondary one has gone away and they're both appearing pretty clean so let's change the voltage per division to 5 volts and take a look back in and it's looking pretty good so we're putting just about 12 volts into it and the spike does not even go up to 15 volts so at this point if you're saying okay so if I use 300 volts then on this IGBT problem solved right well sadly no because the gate resistor used to achieve this is beyond what the manufacturer recommends and what that means is that if we were to use this at full power with that gate resistor the IGBT could get too hot and those little bond wires could melt off of it and that's all that I'm going to say about that for now. You'll have to wait till the next video. And for now, I hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll stick around for the next one. The next one's going to be a little bit more exciting, and we're going to do tons of interesting things with cooling IGBTs. I'm going to show you some real high power stuff, so I'll see you then.